three, two, one. What's going on everyone? You're watching Ash on Comics. My name is Ash. Here's today's comic, Powers of X, aka Powers of Ten, because uh, an X is synonymous with ten, even when you draw it exactly the same for the House of X, um, you're supposed to know the difference. Remember that. So it's House of X, Powers of Ten. Goofy. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, we're here, as always, by, uh, well, not by, <laughs> but with Stan the Man. And because of Stan the Man, uh, my love of comics would not be what it is or may even exist without this legendary uh, creator and uh, just great all-around ambassador for uh, the hobby that we all know and love. Also, uh, mascot and intern to the channel, Forky. Uh, always here to brighten up our day and remind us that we're not trash, but sometimes the comics we read are. Um, I don't have any candy today. I'm kind of bummed. Um, I have carrots. Mmm. Still better than a Milky Way. All right, so I have not read this. I have read the first book, House of X number one, did a review on it. Not terribly proud of that review. I stand by what I said. I just don't feel like I said it very effectively. Uh, I stand by my re rating. It was a three-star rating. I've since sort of slightly altered the way I'm doing my channel. Um, I'm not doing just straight up reviews anymore. I'm gonna review this book. I'm going to read the book. I haven't even read this yet. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to munch some carrots. I'm going to hang out with my boys here. Have a drink. Read some X-Men. And uh, hopefully it's good. Hopefully. First issue, while not necessarily bad in a way that you read it and go, what the heck? You think this is tripe? Hickman is a solid writer. Uh, solid enough writer that you can tell just the way you, the reading experience comes across impressive, I guess. He does have a little bit of a way with words. I appreciate that. I also appreciate that it tend, like you feel like there's something there, like he's got a plan. I appreciate that too. Um, so a lot of modern comics I read, oh my gosh, I, I did a Batgirl review. Oh geez. It just reads like high school fan fiction. Uh, comic book writers, even the bad comic writers of the past, had a craft. They understood what they were doing. Hickman, at least, is not like that. I just want to know if there's a real story here. Are the X-Men the bad guys? Or are they imposters, like we're being led to believe? What's this Powers of X book all about? How does it tie in to the House of X? I'm intrigued. I blew $5.99 on this book, so... Hopefully I like it. I'm going to read it right now. We're going to come back and we're going to discuss it. All right. I finished this book. <laughs> and much like the first book, it's, it's difficult to put my finger on it. Here's the thing, Charles. It's not a dream if it's real. Moira McTaggart. So this book opens up. Immediately, I'm thrown off by the art. It's a different artist than the, the last book. The, or the other book, House of X, has, I believe, a better artist. It's modern Marvel. What are you going to do? X to the zero. I'm not sure I understand how this even works, but is X to the zero property? The X-Men, year one, the dream. You see Charles Xavier's face. X to the first power, the X-Men, year 10, the world. We see what appears to be the Xavier of the House of X with this helmet. It's not 100% the same, but maybe it's because it's a different artist. A little confusing. X2. X to the second power. The X-Men. Year 100. The War. Yet recognizable face. Nimrod, although it's 
a different face of me. It's like it's similar, but yet different. And then X to the third power, the X-Men, year 1000, Ascension. And we get this crazy guy. Back to X-Zero. I'm just going to say that instead of the powers or whatever. Um, now I know why it's powers of 10. <laughs> get it? Powers of 10, each one. So the X-Men, year, year one. We're at some weird carnival. See Charles Xavier walking around. He's walking over to a bench. Oh, he sits on a bench. Look how... Oh, he looks up in the sky. There's birds. Looks over. A woman approaches. Good afternoon. And same to you. Are you enjoying the fair? It seems like the kind of thing I should enjoy, and yet, really... <laughs> Jesus. I look around at all these people, and I know it's just a show for those who need one. Distractions from what's really going on, if you will. Mind if I sit? Please. So are you enjoying the fair? I am. It seems like the kind of thing I would... That I should not enjoy, and yet... A little parting of the clouds, a little shining of the sun, and suddenly everything seems right in the world. Having a good day, are we? Is it that obvious? You'd have to be blind not to notice. In my case, I was just walking, so blah, 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 blah. Fast forward. She has run in with fortune teller. The fortune teller says, See the magician, the metal morph, the great sword, and the girl with one foot and two worlds. See the tower, the axis, and the pillar of the collapse and rebirth, and the monolith of ascension. See the devil, the red god, and the lost cardinal of the last religion. Then, at the far end of the fair, I saw you sitting there, and I thought to myself, there he is, what I've been looking for. They have more conversation, and he's like, I was smiling because I've recently had the most wonderful dream of a better world and my place in it. She gives him a glance. Well, here's the thing, Charles. It's not a dream if it's real. Uh, I'm sorry, do we know one another? Oh, yes. We go back quite a ways. Who are you? Why don't you read my mind, Charles? Read my mind and see. Ah. Uh. You see the shock on his face. Powers of X. Here is the creative staff. Jonathan Hickman, uh, artist R.B. Silva. Other people involved you can read. Um, again, two-page splash for the credits is overkill. You're charging $5.99 a book. You should not be just blowing real estate like this, in my opinion. It's indulgent. X-1. The X-Men, year 10. Krakoa. So we see Mystique showing up with Toad. Remember, this is where we left off in House of X. Um, Mystique and her... Cohorts ripped off, you know, stole some data, whatever, they brought it back. She's at the House of M. Magneto's there. Tell me, Mystique, do I dare dream of success? We lost Sabretooth, and he did us no favors when he killed the guards. But yes, Magneto, I have it. Well done. And she's handing it over, and she yanks it away. But I have demands. Do you now? Is helping your fellow mutant not reward enough for Raven Darkholm? No, it isn't. I need more. Yes, I see that. But it's fair, I suppose. We have further demands as well. Really? And then this is interesting. Charles Xavier is, a, is the world's most powerful telepath. At least in X-Men books that matter. I know in modern comics, we gotta got transcend all that. But in the classic, traditional X-Men, Charles Xavier is, is the world's greatest telepath. He's, but he does not have telekinesis, 
right? This is one of the things that made, sorry, not, not really. Jean Grey, one of his students, was a mild telepath, but she had strong telekinetic abilities and he was trying to teach her and so forth. Um, so this is interesting that we see these telekinetic abilities. He's pulling the data to him. Further evidence or hints that this is not actually really Charles Xavier, which is seems to be the prevailing theory right now, um, that this is some imposter, some think he's the maker from Jonathan Hickman's other series. I believe it was like Fantastic Four and FF. Is helping your fellow mutants not reward enough for the great Charles Xavier? We're building a better mutant world, Mystique, and everyone who would live in it owes something. So it's very sinister. Interesting that I would say sinister. Uh, I did not intentionally mean to have a pun, but Mr. Senator, sinister is very, very much a part of this reality. I believe what we're seeing here is a big cause of Mr. Sinister. And um, we go to X2, the X-Men year 100. And this is where the book shines. I don't want to say gets good, but this is the, the shining moments of the book. So here we see a mutants down. There was a dream. Our dreams are the same. While you slept, the world changed. Northern Territory, the Nexus. This one's dying. I dare hope for something salvageable from its mind, or should I set my expectations toward the human end of the spectrum? Bad news on that front. So these are human warriors. This is a mutant human war of the future. This is like, you know, the days of future past type thing. A reimagining this is some sort of sentinel, or some sort of human warrior. And they're fighting mutants. And uh, they come across this other mutant. We know her. Silo Bell was born in the Keneal. Bred as a black brain telepath, a natural Judas. Subversion was written into her DNA, so they're about to capture her. Um, we see this weird ass three headed sentinel thing, its heads come out. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. And then I see this picture. And I was not liking the artist until I got to this phase of the book. This sentinel looks dope. I love how it's towering, it's imposing, it's got the classic design, but drawn with a modern aesthetic. It's not some sort of like total reimagining, which I hate when they do, and it's like, oh, I'm just gonna totally, no. Um, I love it, this, ah, I love Sentinels, this classic X-Men villain. So we get these introductions, these new characters. We've got Rasputin and Cardinal. Rasputin, um, is a blue haired girl and we're gonna see that she's got looks like the powers of magic which is Peter Rasputin's sister right she can also turn her skin to steel she's got blue skin um, we don't know why uh, we find out though and by the way I'm going over this book and there's gonna be spoilers um, she's trying to rescue her friend which is this the girl the black brain right um, Cardinal, who looks a lot like our favorite hero, Nightcrawler, is a pacifist, much like Nightcrawler was a pacifist. There's some similar ties. Um, their friend is like, you got to go. You got to get out of here. Everything will be for lost if you don't escape. Um, but this one, Rasputin, is a warrior, and she doesn't leave anyone behind, so there's some conflict, and she's like... Um, she can't. She can't stand to see it by. Um, really, dog? Come on. Come on. Wouldn't be an Ash on Comics video without the dog. Um, there's a really cool scene here where it's like, "Will you pray for me, priest?" And they're speaking in um, Silink, another trope of X Men. Of course, my faith is boundless. I pray for all living things. And that's your problem, priest. And she leaps into battle. You have forgotten the machines have no soul. So this is a really cool, dark future, uh, horrific circumstance, you know, that's very Terminator-esque. Um, 
that kind of, I don't want to say it was inspired the Days of Future Past, because Days of Future Past actually predates Terminator, but, you know, the similar environment, um, in which she slices through this, this robot, and that humans lost theirs a long time ago. And that's a really cool statement that will be echoed later in the book. Hello, little sister. I want to go home. Then let's do that. We've got her priest. How soon until the gate's fully grown? So before they had mentioned they were going to plant a, 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 a black seed and teleport back to Krakoa. It's taken root. Not long. Just hold him off a little bit longer. I can do that. I was made for it. You can see she's, her skin turns to steel. Um, nothing's phasing her. Metal or plasma. We need backup. I'm calling in a tank. Gates open. Let's go. Okay, we're now leaving, sister. And she's ready to go. And then boom! Hand comes crashing down. Oof! She slices it with her sword. And this is really cool. I just want to point out the detail in this art. This artist is much more adept at drawing machinery than he is human anatomy. But it's it works. Um, I really, I really enjoy oh, look at that sentinel. Just, it's coming down. Warm. The coloring. Everything is so fantastic about this. Got her. So they've got um, uh, the girl that they're trying to save is captured. And it's like, oh, no. Everything is going to shit. So she leaps in the fray. No. No choice now, sister. Leave me behind. Escape. I will die here before I do. Leave. Please. She's, you know, begging. No. And everyone's, you know, they're dragging her down. She just wants to fight to save her friend. And that's cut off. And already, just right there, this book succeeds over House of X. It's where House of X failed was having nothing to care about in that book. The main characters come across as elitist evil fascists their enemies come off as just a different sect of you know it's like hitler versus uh, uh, uh stalin right it's like there's no good guys there like just because they hated each other doesn't mean one was good and one was bad it was just two bad guys hating each other um fighting for the right to kill more jews i guess like uh, let me get these full page things that the first book introduced us to, and I don't necessarily have a huge problem with. My problem with these is it shouldn't be a five ninety nine book when you're charging a premium, and then you're wasting real estate with just just typed up. You know, someone got on, you know, Microsoft Word, um, but it does give you a lot of backstory. This is the Sinister Line. It talks about the mutant breeding program, all run by Mister Sinister. Um, and they'd have the mutant breeding pits on Mars. So this is a lot of exposition to kind of bring you up to speed on how this world future came. Normally I'm a big proponent and say like show don't tell. This would have been a better story told just in story form so we could learn. But Marvel likes to rush things these days and they're just trying to get us to this new X-Men book. There's a wealth of information that needs to be told and I guess this is just a way of expediting it. And I'm okay, sorta. Um, I don't want to necessarily go through two years of story to learn all this just so we can launch the real book, right? Um, so, sacrifices. Uh, I think I think it's funny that Mr. Sinister ends up betraying everyone. <laughs> it's like, oh, all this failed because Mr. Sinister... I'll let you read it for yourself in the book, but it kind of comes down to it's like, oh, all of it broke down because Mr. Sinister... Like, duh? <laughs> it's like, duh. Why did anyone trust that this guy was going to do anything? <laughs> um, so then they go into this whole thing about Chimera and they explain uh, Rasputin and Cardinal and all this stuff. They're actually different breeding types and there are, are generations. There's the Chimera class, which were generations two and three. Well, technically it's four because they keep talking. It's like the third chimera generation produced mutants of amalgamated DNA, blah, 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 blah. And they're basically splicing multiple X genes together. Most naturally born mutants have one X gene that gives them their powers. Sinister apparently found a way to breed mutants and have multiple. Finally, they get to the fourth generation. Um, fourth generation of mutants suffered a system, systemic failure. The entire batch of these omega-based chimera mutants 
uh, was produced in cr a corrupted hive mind that was only discovered to be defective after they had destroyed 40% of the remaining mutant population and caused the fall of Krakoa itself. They eventually committed mass suicide, collapsing Mars, the Sinister Pits, and themselves into a self-singularity. Uh, that wasn't the part I was looking for, but you can see how there's a lot of this world-building stuff. Here we go. Uh, the third chimera generation produced means with an amalgamated DNA featuring up to five X genes. So then they give you an example down here, and they have the different name, choir, power, tele, you know, so couldn't tell, is it omega level telepath, rank 10, of course, because like I said, modern mutants have to be more powerful than even like Professor X. Name, Rasputin, Metamorphous, Metam, you know, he's six, because he, he transforms to steel, right? So Chimera, the Rasputin Chimera has telepath, metamorphosis, uh, I don't know what Fawful is, um, pride, uh, intangible, I think is what that is, four, um, and then Kinney, heel, so Laura Kinney, that's, that would, that would, that would be it, right? So Rasputin is a level four, level four, five, so, you know, you can see these things. So it, it's, it's a lot of just like gobbledygook, like, but it's bringing you up to speed. And if you're invested in this book, which you should be if you're paying five nine nine. um, this helps matter. And you can just see a visual representation here of the levels. And they, they break it down. It looks more complex than it is. But look, look at this. One, two, three full pages of these Word documents. <sighs> so then they talk more about the outliers, da, 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 and how here's the betrayal part I explained. You can all read it for yourself when you read the book. And now we go to the future. Um, did they and say it? I thought, where's the, well, we're at X3 here, the, the thousand years in the future, I believe. No, 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 we're still on the same time. Never mind. Tower of Nimrod the Lesser, the human machine monolith. So they drag the prisoner in. We see Nimrod. They come bearing gifts. Hmm. And so they, they drag her in. They explain how they're going to try to interrogate her, but she's designed to resist interrogation. Um, this Nimrod's a little goofy. He's just like, oh, that's the spirit. I love it. Clapping his hands together. It's like, he's like apologizing to her being a mutant and how they're failures, but it's, it's still really sinister. <laughs> like, but like this kind of off ball, it's, it's weird. It's not the Nimrod we've all known. Um, this is a girl that I don't know in my hiatus out of X-Men, but she's also in House of X-1. And uh, they need to interrogate her. So they realize the only way they can do it is to give her what they call a bath. And it's this way they, they put her in this fluid and it breaks them down genetically. And then this AI somehow extracts all of the knowledge into machine code. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's comic book science. <laughs> it's like um, all you need to know is that's they're going to. So they put her in the, in the thing and it's all very sinister. We get everyone talking about their plans and their ideology. And then they talk about the Keneal. That's what that girl is. She's a Keneal in the breeding camps and their nicknames are Black Brains. You can read about that on your own. The No Place Hub. Now, if you remember in House of X, they talked about the black Krakoa seeds that exist in, a, in an area that Krakoa is not even aware about. That would be the No Place. I'm sorry. So here we have these resistance mutants, right? So we got Rasputin and Cardinal. And he's explained to her, you know, I wish I was made some other way, but I'm not. I'm just not capable of violence. I would trade places with her if I could. You know that, right? She was gone by the time I was done fighting with them. Gone while you watched. Right now, I think I would take your trade priest. So she's real bitter that she lost her friend. So she comes through the gate. We saw that there were only two of you in transit. What happened? Percival's dead. Silo Bell probably is too. Reveal! Dun, dun, dun! Well, that's too bad. They were both good soldiers. Question is, did they die for nothing? Or was it worth it? Um, so we got Wolverine. Appears to be Magneto. He's wearing green for some reason. Um, I don't know who that is. And that kind of looks like Groot. <laughs> I don't know. The, 
is that Groot? I was like, wait, no, he's got like a different, I don't know. What is that? So maybe he's a different mutant. Wolverine makes sense to be alive. Magneto doesn't. Um, that's why I'm thinking maybe it's someone else. Cause like, remember this is a hundred years into the future, I guess. Um, we've got it. All right. Then follow me. The old man's waiting. And we get more exposition, like these pages. Um, talks about the surviving mutants and how many there's left in this future. Um, and we can see in this in this in the soul system, there are eight total mutants. In the entire solar system, they're all reside on asteroid K. There's other mutants that reside in the Shi'ar, they're like refugees. Um, and they talk about how the Shi'ar Empire is thinking about annexing the soul system, and then they're using mutants as sort of like part of their super forces. This is all kind of real interesting high level stuff. It's like I said, it's all big world building. Um, but like, I don't know what to say. It's just building up this new universe that Hickman's trying to, to set up. Um, now we're here, X3, the X-Men year 1000. And this is threw me off. Remember that black girl? She's still in the tube. It hasn't dissolved her. Like it was like I was a, under the understanding. We see this person sitting down with what looks like Xavier's mask. It's slightly different. Um, the archive of Nimrod the Greater, the mutant library. We're losing them and there's nothing I can do to prevent it. There's too much machinery floating around inside there and not enough soul to save, let alone copy. The blame is not yours, librarian. It's mine. I simply wasn't built to maintain the integrity for a millennium. It's no one's fault, Nimrod. You did exactly what you were meant to. Blah, blah, blah. They're talking about who could have known how pointless and useless that war would be? Who at the time could have seen the surprising end of the human machine mutant war? Homo sapiens. So good to be done with all that. And we see this, you know, dark societal future. Are we done with them? Can we ever really be done with the past? After all, that's what a legacy is, the preserve. And it's why we keep dinosaur bones around. As a reminder of what this world used to be like and, and to remember what we overcame, it's important to record, to keep a record of the great sins of history, even better, to preserve a remnant, something to point at. So they've got this in this future, they got this world, this biome, it's all this preserve, keeping the past, something to point at, and there's a great light. Now, if you know about biblical history and everything, you know, it's like on the seventh day he rested, you know, and at the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Think about this for a moment. There's big light. And hope to God they never have dominion again. Something to point out. And hope to God they never have dominion again. And now we're in a garden with two figures that look remarkably like they're supposed to be Adam and Eve. And my mind was just boom. Um, I could be just reading into this way too heavy. <laughs> but part of me is just like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Are what we reading... Is the story that we're seeing built here not actually reality, but a history repeating itself? Is it a like matrix-like story? Is it all happening within the preserve? Is is it this sort of loop? Is this person here, this librarian person, reshaping things to try to start over? Um or 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 did all of that happen? Everything that we're showing happened the way that it did, led to this horrible future, and now we're going back and this is being created to be the reality that we know, like the good X-Men, you know, this, you know, there's, I, I love sci-fi stories that take the idea uh, and, and twist how we understand reality, like the Matrix I mentioned. I, you just like, wait, we're living in a matrix. This is all just a simulation. While this isn't necessarily a simulation, it's, you know, it's in a pres habitat preserve created by some higher intelligence, right? 
It's still a similar type of thing. The world is not what you think it is. It's a great mind-bending experience when it's done correctly. So what if what if the whole story of the mutants is is this? I don't know. But it makes me instantly want to know more. Um, this book was way better than House of X. House of X just sort of set up the feel and kind of just let you dip your toes in the water to t- test the temperature. This feels like it's revealing some story. Um, it still could go completely south. I'm not... I'm not certain of where it's going. Everything's going to depend on where it ends up. Uh, it's it's very shaky. It's exceedingly um, strong in its potential, but also that leaves a lot of room for failure. It could just drop the ball so hard. I don't know, but this all I what I do know, <laughs> what I do know, is this is not X Men Red. This isn't the mustard and bigotry. Right? This isn't the joke that's Uncanny X-Men that just finished up. This is someone with an idea and a story to tell. I do believe that this book is going to ultimately be a good comic. You've forgotten that machines have no soul and that the humans lost theirs a long time ago, Rasputin. I do believe this is going to be ultimately a good comic, a good story. The question remains is, will it be an X-Men story? Is this something that someone like myself, um, someone like uh, Doc, uh, who I've collaborated with in the past, who's one of the comics aficionados on Wes's channel, Thinking Critical, will this be something that we can appreciate and say, you know what, this is an X-Men story? Or will it just be something brand new and weird? like? That's kind of my iffy thing right now is it can be a good story and it can be well done, but if it's not true to the heart of what makes X-Men X-Men, if you just reinvented and made something completely new and different, well, I guess good for you, but you didn't help it anything for X-Men fans. X-Men fans still don't have X-Men. So great, we get something new, but we don't get X-Men. And why do that? If it, my, my point is, if you're going to tell us a fantastic storyline, but you're not going to honor the characters and the traditions and the things that people love, tell it with different characters. You can do the same story. You can transpose it with, in, you know, a different cast of characters, a different, a whole different genre if you want. It didn't even have to be Marvel characters. Um, I don't know. I do like this. Um, it's It's got a lot of problems for me, but it's still a well-done book. I still think it's a head case, and I still think there's not enough plot to really highly recommend it. This is one of those really sketchy, like if you are a diehard X-Men fan and you just want to go all in and just hope for the best, roll the dice, then pick it up. That's kind of what I did. But this is still kind of a three-star book. It's It's got merit, but it doesn't stand on its own merit. It needs more supplemental material to make it work. Maybe by the end of the day, when House of X and Powers of X is all said and done, all six issues of each are out, then we can look back and reflect and say, wow, that was a powerful story. And that these first chapters were just the beginning. We didn't know what we were doing. And that's great. I really sincerely hope for the best. And if that's the case, I'll rate the overall experience much better. But as it is right now, I can't. This could go down the sewer. I don't know where this is going. And, and, And as a reader, sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes that's not such a good thing. I think a lot of people are going to read this and just be like, nope, tuned out. Nothing's happening. Not interested. Um, and I've already seen evidence of that. I think the people that are going to follow this are the people like me that are just want so bad for an X-Men title to be good. We're going to cling on to that hope. But someone who doesn't have that investment might read this and just be like, what, what am I reading here? Why, why should I? I don't understand. Whatever. I'm going to go back to Batman now. <laughs> so um, thanks for watching. I hope that this video was a little more coherent. As I talked about the book, I hope it gave you some things to think about, some things to talk about. By all means, comment what you on what I had to say or what you think of this book. 
down below in the comments. Um, if you want to discuss in more detail, uh, come join the Discord channel, which is in the description. And uh, I'm thankful for your, your views and uh, thankful for all the people that I've met and uh, sharing this great hobby. Um, Excelsior. Right, Stan?